When we hear about markets being up, down, bullish, or bearish, we're often actually talking about the performance of indices, rather than the market itself. You see, it's difficult to measure the stock market as a whole. So instead, analysts use metrics that summarize the performance of a sample of stocks. And while first intended as a mere gauge, these days indices are the basis of some of the most popular investment strategies to date. Intrigued? We'll dive into the topic and more on today's Plain Bagel. As of June 2016, it is estimated that the US stock market consisted of 4,333 stocks. That's a lot of companies, each of which may be buying back equity, carrying out stock splits, or even reverse splits. Needless to say that all of this makes the market a pretty dynamic place, so it's only natural that trying to understand what's going on can be a bit of a headache. This is why in 1896, a financial journalist by the name of Charles H. Dow came up with an idea to help investors gauge the markets. With the help of his business associate, statistician Edward Jones, Dow took 12 popular stocks from the market most of which were industrial companies, since this was shortly after the Industrial Revolution, and published the average of their prices. The thinking was that readers could use the change in the average as a proxy for the change in the overall market, to get a better grasp on whether markets were up or down. And so came the birth of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Fast forward to today, and the Dow is still in use, though it now tracks 30 shares instead of just 12. And many indices have joined its ranks, but the premise of each is the same. Indices take a sample of stocks, deemed to be representative of a country, sector, or other area, and then somehow average their prices to come to the index's level. This level by itself doesn't matter much, but by following its percentage changes over time, investors can approximate the movement of the underlying market. In other words, many use indices as a proxy for the markets they sample. In fact, it's become a popular practice to invest in the indices themselves to achieve market returns. Clearly, that makes them pretty important. So let's take a moment to learn about indices and how we can use them to invest. Firstly, it's worth noting that there are plenty of indices to choose from when trying to gauge the markets. In fact, there are more indices than US stocks themselves, but only a few are as popular as the original Dow Jones. The S&P 500, for example, is another widely watched index that is seen as one of the best representations of US companies, as it follows the performance of 500 of the largest, but not the 500 largest US companies based on market capitalization. There's also the NASDAQ Composite Index, which is unique in that it measures the price of stocks trading on its own market, also called the NASDAQ. The Dow, S&P 500, and NASDAQ all track the US stock market, but indices exist for other countries as well. If you're interested in following Canadian stocks, you can check out the S&P TSX composite. And for a more global perspective, there's the MSCI World Index. These broad market indices track the performance of a large group of stocks in a country. But if you're looking for more industry-specific information, well, indices have you covered there as well. For example, if you wanted to follow US technology, Canadian banks, or international healthcare stocks, you could check out any of these listed indices to get an idea of how the markets have moved over time. You can also find indices for investment vehicles other than stocks. The S&P 500 Bond Index, for example, is the fixed income counterpart to the S&P 500. And as you would expect, it's a bit slower moving than the S&P itself. So, as you can see, there are plenty of indices to look at when trying to compare the performance of your stocks to the overall market. But their utility has surpassed a mere point of reference. As we've mentioned, their most recent claim to fame is their use as investment vehicles themselves. You see, since indices like the S&P 500 are meant to represent the market as a whole, and because they are diversified by nature, many investors have started using index funds as an easy way to gain investment exposure while keeping costs low. An index fund is a mutual fund, or more broadly an ETF, that mimics an index by either holding all of its constituents or holding a representative sample. And because index funds simply copy an index, they can operate at a lower cost and often charge fees below half a percentage point. This makes them a popular option for passive investors, who believe mimicking the market is better than trying to beat it. Though active investors have also adopted index funds as a way to expand and limit their exposure to certain industries and countries. Since markets as a whole have moved up over the last decade, index funds have done pretty well for investors in recent history. The 10-year average total return for the S&P 500, for example, sits at around 9.6% a year as of June 1st. But there are important considerations to take into account before committing to an index fund strategy. Firstly, it's worth noting that an index fund will always lag behind the index it follows, assuming there's no tracking error. This is because indices don't take into account transaction and management costs, so your after-cost return will always be lower than that of the index. Additionally, certain indices may not be as diversified as you would expect. 
The NASDAQ, for example, has a 42.5% weighting to information technology, just one of 11 sectors. And even the S&P 500 with its large stock base provides little exposure to small cap firms. But most importantly, you need to understand that different indices can provide totally different returns, even if they track the exact same market segment. The reason for this is twofold. The first is that indices may have different sample sizes and criteria. The Dow Jones, for example, has a much smaller universe of stocks than the S&P 500. The second reason, which is a bit trickier to understand, is that indices can follow different methods for calculating their level. You see, indices use one of four different weighting methods when averaging the prices of their stocks. And depending on the method used, you may find an index moving at a different rate or even a different direction than other indices. Confused? Well, look at it this way. Let's say we have four indices that all measure the price changes of the same three stocks, and for simplicity reasons, all start at a level of 1000. Each index follows one of four different weighting methods, so as the stocks change in value, each of the index levels will show a different return. The price weighted index, for example, will give more weighting to stocks with higher prices. This is the method used by the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and while it's simple to calculate, weights are sometimes arbitrary. The market cap weighted index will instead give more weight to firms with larger cumulative share values, under the belief that these companies are more representative of the underlying market. This is how the S&P 500 is calculated, and it's a pretty intuitive method, though it gives little representation to smaller companies. The equally weighted index is pretty self-explanatory. Each share, regardless of size, has an equal impact on the index level. And finally, the fundamental index will weight companies based on some accounting metric, such as their annual sales. So, even though the indices all represent the same universe of stocks, we are presented with four totally different measures of their performance, none of which are necessarily superior or incorrect, but each of which comes with their own strengths and weaknesses. Interesting, isn't it? But before you go throwing your index funds out the window, this isn't meant to discourage you from using them. They are still a great way to invest. You just need to be aware that in choosing an index, you are making a decision about what type of security you are giving more weight to and how your performance is measured. So before you buy an index fund, as always, do the research, both into the index itself and the fund you're buying. This is especially important because of how index funds can modify their holdings. Some provide currency hedging, and others will actually change the weighting method of the index it follows. So you could end up with an equally weighted S&P 500 or Dow ETF. Clearly, this means even more decisions you have to make as an investor. So take your time to understand how your solution works. If you find an index that you want to invest in, search online for some of its funds. Once you've gathered some potential funds, read the fund facts document of each to see how much they cost, how closely they track the index, and whether they've added any modifications. So. Hopefully I've demonstrated that while indices are far from perfect, they do offer a useful insight into the markets. And whether you invest actively or passively, index funds can offer a great source of diversification, so long as you understand their limitations. And with that said, we're out of time. If you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you like what we're doing here, please subscribe. Hit the bell icon to make sure you get notifications about future videos. If you have any feedback or topics you'd like us to cover in future videos, leave a comment down below. For The Plain Bagel, my name is Richard Coffin. Thanks for joining me today.